Thank you everyone for joining. It's a pleasure to have everyone here today. And it's my honor to introduce the inaugural ISPD NAC Eastern Time Zone Journal Club. It's an expansion of efforts that were piloted by Osama El Shami and Tom Golper initially in the central time zone and also into the Pacific time zone and now to us. We're gonna be meeting monthly and I look forward to hosting everyone. I want this to be a positive experience for everyone. I want this to be low stress for everyone and educational for all of us. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Himesh Sheth. Uh, please note we are recording, so if you have any concerns about being recorded, I just want to let you know that now. Uh, and he will be talking to us about an article, uh, Peritoneal Dialysis-Related Infection Rates and Outcomes, which are results from the PDOPS. And I will hand it over. All right. Thank you, Dr. Shah, and thank you for this opportunity to open up this uh, conference. Um, as uh, Dr. Shah mentioned, I'm a second-year fellow here at uh, Brown uh, University Nephrology Program. And uh, we'll start with this first, uh, this is the article, which is uh, peritoneal dialysis related infection rates and outcomes and uh, results from the peritoneal dialysis outcome and practice pattern study, also known as PDOCS. This uh, involves, it's a multi-national uh, uh, collaboration. It's US, Canada, UK, Thailand, Japan, and Australia and New Zealand as reported as one. Uh, for uh, just a brief on a, a PD related peritonitis or infection, uh, just a brief pathophysiology. Infection sites or origination can happen from open catheter uh, transfer set, and that's one way of getting the infection in. Exit site infection that can get through a physical barrier. Most commonly used uh, physical barrier is cuff, two cuff system, one in the sub-Q and one in the muscle, and then peritoneal cavity. So you can have transfer set related infection introduced. You can have biofilm formation uh, on the tubing and that's difficult to get rid of, but uh, that's another uh, way of uh, infection infection during insertion of the peritoneal dialysis catheter and important to distinguish between PD peritonitis versus pre-PD peritonitis and we'll go over that definition. Uh, another way is hematogenous spread which would be very detrimental but uh, nonetheless can happen uh, and contaminated fluid, uh, PD fluid that's contaminated and inserted into the cavity can lead to just rapid growth and peritonitis. And what's not mentioned here, which we also see is gut translocation that can lead to multi-organ organism uh, peritonitis. So just a brief on routes of peritonitis and routes for infection. So background again for related to this study is why do we want to look into the episodes of peritonitis uh, is because Peritonitis infection leads to transfer of patients out of peritoneal dialysis and onto intermittent hemodialysis. So it's important to study this topic. Uh, peritoneal repeat peritonitis can also lead to membrane dysfunction, can change patient's transport status, uh, UF can go down, and therefore we should definitely look into why certain factors may cause peritonitis. Peritonitis can lead to hospitalizations, as we can, we'll see uh, the rate is surprisingly high, at least to me. Uh, repeat peritonitis episode can also increase the cost of providing care to our patient uh, because peritonitis is supposed to be relatively cheaper way of delivering dialysis compared to hemodialysis. So, but if we continue to have peritonitis episode, the cost of care goes up and negates our some of the goal of why we do this. And least, uh, the most concerning uh, is really bad infection can lead into catastrophic events and death. So it's important to go over uh, peritonitis in peritoneal dialysis patients. So not related to our original article, but just wanted to highlight the importance of uh, focusing on peritonitis infection. This study uh, looked at the amount of time spent on dialysis and reason why a patient or patients exit 
PD time. And this was a five-year follow-up. From the beginning to five years, main reason you can see here, uh, transfer to hemodialysis was the main reason why patient had to exit peritoneal dialysis. Second is transplant, which is the ideal scenario, but unfortunately there is also death. So one, two, and three reasons why patients spend less time on peritoneal dialysis or exit PD modality. Now, further breaking that down, reason why patients get transferred to intermittent hemodialysis is on this A side, you can see most common reason is infection. Um, that's in every country you look at, infection is the main reason why there's a modality transfer from hemodia uh, PD to HD. And then when you look at if the vintage also, regardless of what year you're in, infection remains the highest reason why a transfer happened from PD to HD. And therefore, it's very important to kind of identify factors that lead to peritonitis so that we can prevent this from happening for the reasons mentioned earlier. Now, before we dive in, just wanted to set the stage up with the uh, definitions where ISPD, uh, International Society of Peritoneal Dialysis, uh, defines periton peritonitis as two of the following, and they are abdominal pain or cloudy dialysis effluent, effluent WBC count of greater than 100 with uh, greater than 50% being polys, or and or positive effluent culture. Two out of the three will qualify you as peritonitis episode. Uh, P, it's as I mentioned earlier, it's important to distinguish between PD peritonitis versus pre PD peritonitis because that may be a surgical reason why they have infection. And definition of pre PD peritonitis is peritonitis happening within 30 days of catheter insertion. And uh, ISPD peritonitis rate or the recommendation of uh, targeting the peritonitis is. 0.4 episodes per patient year or less is the goal to keep it below that. And uh, oftentimes we don't identify organism, uh, but uh, there is a cutoff where your institution or the facility should hopefully not exceed 15% uh, for culture negative peritonitis. Otherwise we need to look at why this is happening, perhaps change why, the way we collect the cultures and the techniques. So going back to the study, uh, PDOPS is the largest international observational cohort study. It identifies incidents of PD-related peritonitis. It collects detailed information in a very uniform way uh, related to PD-related peritonitis and identify practice patterns that may lead to PD peritonitis related to peritonitis incidents. So methods, so the data source, um, so this study was a three-year study starting from 2014 to 2017, a uh, prospective cohort study in included countries, uh, Australia and New Zealand as one, Japan, Thailand, United Kingdom, Canada, and US. Uh, patient population that were eligible to be enrolled uh, 18 years or older, receiving maintenance uh, peritoneal dialysis only because I believe Japan has a hybrid system, but those patients were not included in this study. Uh, patient enrollment was at random, but uh, stratified, and we'll see the stratification later, what uh, uh, patient characteristics they looked at, but uh, it was at random selection and facilities. So one of the enrollment criteria for the facility is minimum of 20 patients had to be in the facility at the time of enrollment into this study. And uh, what was collected is uh, episodes of peritonitis, episodes of hospitalization, causative organism during the period, uh, follow-up period. So those were the events that were recorded. 
and data obtained by manual extraction. And for US large dialysis organizations, the electronic files were provided and data was abstracted from those files. So now, how were the uh, outcomes defined? It's the when there was a peritonitis episode, the staff actually was the one that provided if there was an ep peritonitis episode and also reported if that peritonitis episode led to hospitalization. And every resolved peritonitis episode was counted as an episode and the causative organism, or if it was a culture negative peritonitis, it was all recorded. Um, so relapsing peritonitis rate were excluded in this calculation, but recurrent peritonitis rate were not excluded. And the definition they used was uh, relapsing episodes were ex uh, occurring. A relapsing episode is an episode of peritonitis occurring 22 to 50 days after previous episode. And that peritonitis was caused by same organism or either first or the second episode, either one uh, were culture negative or both were culture negative. That's relapsing and recurrent occurring 20 to two within 50 days, but different organism. So just uh, to again, relapsing episodes were not included in this calculation. Um, let's see. So country peritonitis rate reported as number of peritonitis episodes in the country divided by patient follow-up time in that country per patient year. Uh, United States as a reference point uh, for overall peritonitis rate and for comparison. Facility peritonitis rate similar as above number of peritonitis episode in the facility divided by patient follow-up time in the facility. And uh, data collected until the end of the study for patients who remained in the study, or if the patient uh, transferred to a different facility, the data was censored at the time of transfer, or at the time of transplant, or at the time of withdrawal. And uh, if the patient transferred out to HD, the data was censored then, but with the caveat that the patient has to be on hemodialysis for more than 84 days after leaving, and that's when they would count, they would censor the data at the time they left. Uh, so now statistical method, they used rate ratio using 95% confidence interval for reporting peritonitis episode per facility with facility characteristic as listed above number of patients in the uh, in the facility, uh, how old the facility has been in the oper in operation for, percent of patients in the facility using APD if that led to increase or decrease chance of uh, peritonitis, use of icodextrin or use of a neutral pH and low GDP solution, patient to nurse ratio if that led to any significant uh, increase or decrease risk rate ratio, antibiotic prophylaxis duration during catheter insertion, exit site prophylaxis, and PD training duration by facility. So these were the facility characteristics they looked at and reported individually, and the way of reporting was rate ratio with 95% confidence interval. Next is... Uh, case mix adjustment. This is the stratification that was done uh, for the patient. And again, rate ratio of 95% confidence interval, stratified by age, sex, black race in the United States, PD vintage, serum albumin, 24 hour urine volume, if they did or did not have cardiovascular disease, diabetes, GI bleed, and if patients were on hemodialysis before starting PD. So this table shows the characteristics of the patient. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, it was adjusted 
uh, for various things. But some highlights that I wanted to point out is that uh, uh, kidney replacement therapy vintage was highest in Japan and United States. Uh, serum albumin level was slightly lower in Thailand compared to others. And also in Thailand, urine volume was slightly lower compared to other countries. Uh, diabetes and cardiovascular disease were common among all the countries. And uh, APD use was predominant in all the countries except Thailand and Japan. And 96% uh, of facilities in Japan had no exit site strategy. In Japan, due to, and that is because there is a concern for resistance development by using the topical antibiotic and therefore that use is not funded. So less than 5% of facilities use topical antibiotic. And in UK, only less than 50% used gentamicin or mupiracin as a prophylactic strategy, exit site prophylaxis. Uh, this is a shout out to Home Dialysis University is where I got this slide from Dr. Marotra uh, presented it. Just uh, if there are any fellows in the conference, uh, how to come about uh, calculating the rate of uh, peritonitis, which is, for example, you start a unit 72 patients, it's a new unit, which is surprising with the 72 patients in the unit, but uh, let's say you, you go by 10 months, you want to calculate the peritonitis rate, you convert the 10 months into year, 0.83 years, and so 72 patients times 0.83 years, you get 60 patient year, and in that time frame, let's say you have 30 episodes, so now you have 30 episodes in 60 patient year, you just do divide division and you have 0.5 episodes per patient year, and that's how the rate is uh, calculated. So moving on to uh, the result, this is the broad picture of what happened, how many peritonitis rate in each country. So here you can see United States being the lowest uh, 0.26 peritonitis episode per patient year and highest seen in Thailand 0.4 peritonitis rate uh, episodes per patient year which is the upper limit of uh, what ISPD recommends. Uh, breaking it down further, uh, majority of the countries, it, pretty much all except for Thailand, had gram positive as a dominant organism, and Thailand had gram negative. One thing I want to point out in Thailand is they had a pretty substantial amount of culture negative peritonitis. Breaking down gram positive, it's half and half between uh, staph aureus and staph epi, where Australia, New Zealand, Canada, US had staph epi, and staph aureus was more likely to identify it in Japan, Thailand, and United Kingdom. Fortunately, what we think of catastrophic fungal or yeast was not very common. Uh, the graph at the bottom or the table at the bottom shows what happened to those peritonitis rate and how many went into the hospital. So you can, with pretty certainty, you can say that the likelihood of patient being in the hospital is 50, greater than 50% based on this data and uh, lowest being hospitalization rate in Canada and highest in, uh, in Japan. And length of stay is very variable where Length of stay was 18 days in Japan, highest and lowest in Australia, New Zealand, and uh, UK. And as I mentioned before about the exit site prophylaxis strategy, as expected, uh, low in Japan, and that translated, or assuming, extrapolating, translated into uh, reason for this peritonitis episode 19% was in Japan as an exit site as a cause. UK was 20%. But, but before you leave, can stay on? Can you go back? Yes. <clears throat> uh, I, I'm interested in the US, so let's just zone in on that column. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you look at the uh, the third, fourth line down is 37%, and you Correct. have 37, 13, 16, 5, 1 and 28, that, that adds up to 100, okay? And then yeah. I don't understand what those last three 
are then. I understand that there are specific organisms, but I don't understand what the percentage is. I don't understand that at all. Do you? Okay. Let's see. So I would be able to help out there. So I think the percentage they're reporting is the percentage of total. So to give an example for coag negative staph, 21% of total peritonitis was coag negative staph. But if you want to see what percentage of gram positive was coag negative staph, it would be actually about 54% because I got lucky and picked gram positive. That was a simple 0.10 to divide by. So I think the percentage is essentially the same as the above ones. Uh, they could have chosen to report percentage of gram positive for coag negative staph, staph aureus, and percentage of gram negative for pseudomonas, but they just reported the overall rate. So if I'm understanding it correctly, uh, between the 21% of coagulase negative staph and 7% for aureus, that's 28%. And, and then that leaves uh, the other gram positives, the remainder from 37 minus 28. Is, am I reading that correctly then? I believe so. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. While you're there, could I uh, point out that other was 28%, which seems like a pretty high number. And I don't know what that 28% represents. I imagine, I don't know, that maybe a sample wasn't drawn for peritonitis. I mean, did they comment on that? Because when you think about it, when you look at these numbers, 28% was the second highest cause of peritonitis. Yeah. Well, Joel, that's why I'm, that's why I'm, I'm raising that issue because this did not make sense to me. And again, I'm only paying attention to the US. And the reason that's important, particularly for the fellows, is if something doesn't make sense in a study, be careful on, on considering it the gospel, okay? Because something doesn't make sense. And Joe's point about other being such an enormous number, and, and uh, uh, we, my, my program at Vanderbilt was part of this, and Osama is involved with, with Jeff uh, uh, Pearl in this. And uh, is Osama on? I've not even seen, is he? I don't believe so. All right. So you, as his good friend, should really pin him down. <laughs> yeah, the the methods were a little bit difficult to deduce from this because the methods reference to the PDOPS website. And so you essentially had to go kind of layer by layer to go through the PDOPS website to find uh, more detail. So this was not able, we were not able to figure this out. We did actually discuss this uh, beforehand and struggled to find the interpretation because the methods kind of send you on a search. All right. Uh, actually, with, with the statistic questions you bring on, the next one, uh, I have a question about this as well, and maybe someone can help me. But uh, this shows the mean facility peritonitis rate per country. So. For example, U.S. 103 facilities with combined, the peritonitis rate was 0.24, and then this gives you 90th percentile, 10th percentile uh, per country. And here you can see pretty much everyone manages to stay below 0.4, uh, maybe UK is inching up there, but a uh, couple of countries with the uh, 75th percentile because the top is 75th and bottom is 25th go way above 0.4 of recommended which is UK, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and Thailand. The question I had about this statistics is uh, maybe it's just I don't understand the math but here in US the mean is 0.24 and in the previous we saw the mean episode is 0.26. Am I like they don't I think I know and I don't understand it, but I the discrepancy a little bit. That's a good question. Uh, I don't have an immediate answer for you. I do think that, yeah, actually, I don't have an immediate answer for it. Yeah, I, I would expect uh, that to be the uh, same, but that's not the yeah. case. I just wanted to point that out. If anyone later in the discussion, if anyone can think of it and Kind of shed light. Is it is it the difference between the facility rate versus peritonitis rate? Yeah, so the peritonitis rate in the facility for US, the mean was 0.24. Uh, 
uh, and the previous, the national uh, is 0.26. I agree. I think it's the difference between the first one is all patient all together. And the second one is the mean for the facility. So the statistics is not exactly the same because here it, each center is equal in the distribution, but you have smaller centers and larger centers. So the weight of each peritonitis will be a little bit different. Oh, okay, part. okay. Now I know why the variation. Okay, yeah. makes sense. And, and, Thank you. Uh, in our program at Vanderbilt, so this is about two years ago, it varied over the course of the year by a factor of three. We were as low as 0.14, and then we were up way above 0.5, probably close to 0.6 or 0.7. And because uh, it, it happens in spurts, at least it did for us, I, I don't know. I, I, and I think that's so in Southeast Asia too, uh, mm. and it's somewhat weather related. But nonetheless, uh, uh, it, it does matter when you, when you uh, do the analysis. Exactly. I mean, there's okay. a... Time factor. Uh, Tom, it was higher for you in the warmer months. I I can't recall that, but that is the historical and, yeah. and, and national norm, and we've always attributed that to sweat and and organisms like to grow uh, in the warmer. Uh, but uh, uh, what about you? What what did you have you noticed that? Yeah, we've seen a little bit of variation. I think it's been more in warmer months, but. Well, it doesn't get warm where you live, so I don't know how you. Well, can make it. yeah, not not true anymore. <laughs> I was going to say the uh, I don't know about our variability, but if we are seeing more in warmer months, and if there is a temperature dependence to peritonitis with climate change, we are going to we may need to increase our targets because we we're going to see more. Right, and here Thailand warm, uh, Australia, New Zealand. So I guess the UK, you can't really well, say that. You know, if we're going to, I don't know when we're going to get to the international comparisons, but I have some pretty grave reservations about the about, about them. Okay. I'll, I'll move on to the study yeah. and we can discuss it later. Yeah. So I, I think this is a few slides uh, here and on are very important because they highlight the characteristic of a facility that either showed to be significant increased risk or decreased risk of peritonitis. So first is the size of the facility, a facility with 40 patients versus facility with 50 patients because the difference had to be 10, did not show any difference, especially adjusted for patient factors. Uh, the relative risk is one with 95% confidence interval. So seems like the size was not a factor that would contribute to episodal peritonitis. I would Next, like to highlight one thing about that, which is yep. I think that there is a strong literature on center effect and size of centers uh, being associated with peritonitis. But the inclusion criteria here was that every facility had to have a minimum of 20. So Correct. you're missing all of those small centers. So this is an argument against the center effect once you hit a threshold of 20. Uh, whether there's further thresholds to be seen okay. would need to be further interpreted, but I wouldn't completely discount that center effect because those tiny centers are not here. Okay, agree. Good point. Uh, so the second is uh, the age of the facility, how long it has been in operation. Uh, one 10 years, the other one 15, because the difference here highlighted is five years. Uh, did not show any uh, relative risk uh, difference uh, given the confidence interval and also the relative risk of 1.01. You, you Next, know, can I, can I just comment on that? You see, yeah. I'm not, sh I'm not, I under, I'm not sure why anybody thought that that would make a difference unless we think that dirty old buildings are a cause of peritonitis. I would think what would be much more interesting and impossible to get would be the staff experience that's you know the 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 because uh that seems and the staff turnover things like that that would seem to me to be much more likely to show something okay not the facility age itself okay noted i think that um, was done in one study where some of the older staff were who did the training was associated with 
high yeah, risk you're, you're of right. infection. Yeah. It was done at some point, and the thought was maybe these older staff need periodic retraining themselves or something. Um, it, I, I remember it's been done at some point. Yeah, it's a study from China, Carolyn. Mm, thank you. And I believe the same thing's been shown actually in nurses who train patients for HHD. Oh, oh. and phys physicians probably need retraining too. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, next is the use of uh, automated uh, peritoneal dialysis or cycler. And here you can see the relative risk is 0.95 with confidence interval just touching at one. So you can interpret that. But to me, it shows that there is maybe some validity to like relative risk is low and uh, using a cycler may be better. And break it down by country. Uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada are less than one, and uh, Japan, uh, relatively wide confidence interval, so maybe a little bit more data needed, but seems like APD may be a, may be a good thing, use of APD may be a good thing to reduce the chance of infection. So this was a question I wanted actually to bring to the group, because um, a number of our clinics train patients directly to the cycler. And mm -hmm. I've argued against that. And so when I look at this data, if you look at the peritonitis rate for, for Thailand versus for Japan, they're very different. Japan is much lower. And yet they both have large amounts of patients on CAPD. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, you know, when you look at the literature, if you go back 20 years, um, there's no difference between CAPD and APD. But I think it's because 20 years ago, most patients were on CAPD. If you think about it now, the patients who are on CAPD tend to be patients who uh, may have uh, social determinants of health. They may be sicker, more frail. Maybe they can't read English. Maybe they don't have the dexterity to operate a cycler. So I think there's a selection bias now when you look at the newer literature comparing APD to CAPD. But I'd be interested to hear what other people think, because I still think it's important for patients to go home on CAPD for at least a few weeks. So the selection bias uh, will completely balance the other direction when uh, uh, physicians are worried that this person's connectivity skills might be jeopardized and therefore should go on a cycler to start with. See, Paige, that's just the opposite of what you said. And so uh, it, it is, the selection bias is, is very possible. In the start, when before all this, uh, and you're right about 30 years ago, because I, I, I described it in the Network 9 study, uh, the less frequent the connections, the lower the peritonitis rate. Hence the idea of a cycler connecting once at night and once during the day, or, you know, once at night and once in the morning. So I think the selection bias cuts both ways, Paige. I think you're right, but it also cuts the other way. Hmm. <clears throat> okay. So next is uh, the percent of patients using icodextrin in the facility and uh, maybe concern about uh, chemical peritonitis or peritonitis in general, there was no difference uh, given the relative risk ratio for use of icodextrin. And similar thing was noted uh, when looking at the neutral pH and low GDP solution where the relative risk was still, I would say argue for one with the pretty narrow confidence interval. So you can say that. Uh, what about uh, how many patients a nurse takes care of? You have, one may argue that more patients per nurse may cause an issue, but at least in this study, there was no difference noted that would lead to peritonitis episodes. Um, and then uh, prophylaxis strategy. Did, did they, excuse me. Did they? I didn't. Were the, did they report the the nurse patient ratios? Yes. Uh, let me go back to a table. I believe they did uh, this table. This is important for everybody who will ever have anything to do with managing a dialysis facility, because of course, 
everybody always has too many patients to take care of. So PD patients about. right here, PD patients per mm -hmm. nurse, 12, uh, so US is 11, UK eight, Thailand is 38, Japan is eight, Canada 15, Australia, New Zealand 12. And average, uh, yeah, and then missing data of 11. So uh, very am, am, am I missing something, but for wiser people in the group, these are much smaller numbers than I think what LDOs and other major dialysis organizations uh, advocate in this country. So I'm in Canada, but I'm very impressed by these numbers because usually we hear one for every 20 or one for 25 patients. So exactly. I wish we, I wish yeah. we had these, this ratio. Well, this is, it's strange that, I mean, it's interesting. It would be interesting to look more at the distribution, but uh, uh, anyway, just wanted to highlight that because this is not, not what we're used to. Do, do we know if it's per full-time nurse or if? Right. So it did not, not, the paper did not specify that. Um, so I, I'm not sure. Do, do we also know uh, whether any of these units uh, uh, took care of children? 18 mm. or older only. Okay. Okay. And, and we also pointed out that the unit size was 20. Correct. Or 20 more or to get in. And Minimum, so yeah. that, that's it. To the point of staffing ratios, we were hoping we were trying to expand our nursing staff. And I reached out to the ANNA to see if they had any literature or anything supporting that we could bring to our hospital system. And they have nothing to support staffing ratios. They were suggesting 25 to 1. Uh, so I did not bring that to our hospital system. But uh, the ANNA also was not able to provide anything to support staffing ratios like this. You know, uh, uh... You can pick a staffing ratio you want, uh, uh, but you have to hire the nurses. And uh, the ANNA will be the first to tell you about their shortage. Your Every LDO is telling you about their shortage. So you can pick whatever ratio you want. Uh, uh, if any of you have extra nurses, uh, let me know and uh, I'll occupy them, okay? I think right. in the methods they've mentioned that that some of the staffing, nursing staff uh, included non-nursing staff in those numbers. Oh, okay. So that may account for some of that, those small ratios. And, and, and that is the state by state uh, rule, okay? Uh, technicians in some states can do things uh, uh, that they can, they're not allowed to do in others. So that may be applicable, but not uniformly applicable. Hmm. It may be worth pausing for a moment to discuss ways that we've been able to address our nursing shortages. We have uh, recently hired one of our inpatient nurses who worked on the PD nursing floor and developed an interest in PD. Uh, we're all in the same battle where we're all, we're all fighting for the same nurses. Uh, so I'm curious how others have been able to creatively expand their workforce and support their patients. Well, we, we did hire a... Uh... Um, somebody who had worked as a hemodialysis patient care technician to be a, a technician to help out on the on, with the PD program, the PD and home HD program. And the ability to do that varies, as Tom pointed out, from state to state. Uh, there are some states where the RNs aren't allowed to delegate anything to a PCT, and there are other states where PCTs can actually do quite a bit, including making connections. Uh, but for example, like in California, PCTs are not allowed to make the connection uh, to the catheter. So it's it's very variable depending on the state, as Tom has pointed out. It'll be interesting to see the data, like PCT connection versus nurse connection and the episodes of peritonitis in that scenario. Um, so yeah, I will... I will move on to the next slide where, oh, sorry, last point here. Use of uh, prophylaxis at the exit site uh, seems to have pretty, the relative risk ratio is low, but it crosses over one and uh, pretty wide confidence interval, especially if you look at Canada, very wide confidence interval. Same applies to Thailand and pretty much all over. So 
maybe we need more data, but uh, relative risk ratio is a little below one. And uh, this, again, this table does not include Japan because like I've mentioned a couple of times that uh, they don't use exit site prophylaxis because of funding issues. And that's because uh, concern for resistance development. And uh, UK does not, less than 50% uh, had been using gentamicin or mupiracin for prophylaxis facilities, or less than 50% facilities. And so the next is other strategies of uh, prophylaxis is intranasal mupiracin was the most uh, widely other strategy that was used and also relative risk ratio low, but again, confidence interval very wide everywhere. Uh, then comes the insertion of uh, catheter and use of antibiotic prophylaxis then. Uh, again, this would kind of pre PD peritonitis if depends on when the data was collected, but uh, over with a good uh, relative risk ratio and the confidence interval, you can say that use of antibiotic during the insertion of catheter is a good thing in preventing peritonitis. And then this uh, duration of training is, uh, they broke it down between incident patient and uh, prevalent patient, and the cutoff was six months. But uh, for, let's see, all countries, regardless of incident or prevalent, PD training greater than six days is better at preventing versus less than six days of training. And for that's especially true for prevalent patients uh, who are already in the system for more than six months and their relative risk is lower with the confidence interval also not crossing over one. So that's that. And uh, yeah, so th those are the facility characteristics where very, I think to me was very good, uh, important thing to look at. Now in terms of discussion, just kind of, very broad summary is overall peritonitis rate amongst all the countries, uh, 0.28 events per patient year with the highest being in Thailand, lowest being in the United States. Uh, peritonitis leading to hospitalization, you can be pretty, more than 50% of patients with peritonitis will end up in the hospital with varying degree of uh, hospital length of stay depend on what country you're on, you're in. And then uh, ISPD recommends less than 0.4, which on average was less, but there was significant variability amongst country and amongst facility. Uh, so something that needs to be looked at more and addressed. But uh, in general, if you're having, my takeaway from this was if you are, your facility is having a problem with the infection rate, things to look at and modify and can potentially lower the rate is use of APD, but we did have that debate on that. Uh, exit site prophylaxis, make sure that is appro appropriately used and enforced and taught over and over that make sure you use it. You can add intranasal in addition to exit site prophylaxis, but no data for that. And uh, catheter insertion at the time, use of antibiotic uh, is very important. And uh, make sure education is thorough and frequent if needed. So I look at these points as like a high yield points that you can use to lower your infection rate before going to a various other variables that may cause infection or peritonitis at the facility. And this was a great uh, abstract that was done by the author, Jeff Pearl, but basically this visual abstract and summary of what we talked about. And with that, I believe that's that. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Schaff, could you go back to your uh, uh, the slide before your visual abstract? This one. Uh, so uh, I want to make a couple comments. Uh, yes. <clears throat> while I'm talking about uh, this, I, I want you all to think whether you've ever put uh, uh, mupiracin in your nose. I want you to think about that, and we'll come back to it. Uh, so the one of the things I, I could not get done in my unit was uh, mandatory retraining. Uh, and by that, I, used, I meant about two hours every year. We just, we could not get it accomplished. 
And so we took a compromise position that if any event occurred, there, there would be mandatory retraining, which as I said, it's only a couple of hours. And, and in those programs where they did routine retraining, uh, then Beth Brano's program is the best example I can think of for that. Uh, and you DCI folks can comment if, if that's still the case uh, for Beth's program. But, but uh, I think retraining is good. Uh, I'll come back to the, the reason we advocated exit site uh, creams was because people aren't going to put it in their nose. And the, if you want to eradicate staph uh, uh, nasal carriage, there's no duration of time that is the answer to that with three times a day application. And so that is why it was exit site uh, recommendations. Uh, I, it beats me why Japan wouldn't, wouldn't uh, uh, cover it. The, the rate of uh, resistance is extremely low. It takes 10 to 20 years for, your, for you to have programmatic resistance to mupirocin. Steve Voss showed that years ago. Uh, and uh, yeah, there you go. Those are my comments on this last slide. Tom, um, um, regarding retraining, I, I agree with you that it's, it's hard to do two hours retraining. And I agree with you that it should be prompted by an event. And one way to get the event is to do skill set check. Uh, which we try to do every three or four months. So what that will do, it'll fil filter out those people who don't necessarily need retraining versus those who may need retraining because they don't pass the skill set. And that is, you know, a 20 minute uh, thing, which is much more uh, easily done during, you know, a, a, either the clinic visit or a special day that's set aside. Joel, you ought to write that up. You really ought to. Okay. One, um, one thing I also wanted to kind of uh, clarify and also mention that we are talking about patient retraining, but based on our debate, our discussion earlier, maybe the older staff and staff in general also needs retraining on how to train the patient and what's the ideal way of providing care. The other point I'd like to make, which I, I think this group knows, but I, I always think we need to say it whenever we see an observational study is there's a difference between what was done and what should be done, right? So the observation is what we're looking at, the observation about these, uh, these practice patterns and the outcomes. It doesn't necessarily mean that by doing it, in your, it, it will help, right? All right? Just make sure we use the right terminology so that. Uh, yep. So t Tom, uh, I think I have put mupirocin in my nose. Uh, I, or at least, you know, right below at the, at the at the antrum of the nares. Were you implying that it was particularly noxious, or uh, no, Clem? It's it's a, 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 a it's hard to do three times a day, and yes, that's and, what's needed, and that's okay. the point. Compliance okay. was the issue, but it yeah, isn't it, fun. It it is it isn't fun. So so I wanted to ask a question, make a point about the the data. Um, Himesh, did they, uh, did they just, they didn't do any analyses. As I understand it, some of these data came from chart review and some were reported directly through computer systems. So yeah, what I got out of reading is that they went to the facility, asked the facility staff, uh, what are the patients that had peritonitis? and facility staff identified those patients and uh, also who ended up in the hospital. So same thing happened at the LDOs, but the LDOs in, like provide to give access to the chart. Right, to but what, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is do you, it's your impression that they also went to the individual LDO facilities and said who had peritonitis? Correct, that's my understanding. Because I tell you, what I'm worried about in, and this could be a source of this could confound the international variations because L, you know dialysis or, or the, organ, the the organizational size varies I think by country. What I worry about is that 
when people have to put things into computer systems, they don't always do it. And they may be, it may, they may be not doing it because they're embarrassed and they want, to, they want to hide their peritonitis, or they may just be doing it because they don't get to it. And so I worry that if we were relying entirely on data feeds, that we might be substantially undercounting and that we might be creating spurious apparent international variation. Hmm. So I just want to identify that as a as something, I mean, I think in the future, I mean, I know from DCI experience, we, you know, we're working to try to get all of our cultures sent to a central lab because we know that not everything that's done locally is getting yeah. is getting entered. You know, not that not that people are necessarily trying to cover up, but it's just you know there's too much to do. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we have any PDOP site PIs who can elaborate on what the process was. Uh, I know Osama is one, but he wasn't able to make it today. I don't know if anyone else here is able to give that experience. Possibly not. <laughs> so uh, Clemens, let me make a comment, uh, and I don't know if Paige is still on. Uh, when Joe Pulliam, uh, after uh, renal care group uh, merged with Fresenius, and, and uh, Joe Pulliam was the uh, uh, home, home dialysis director, uh, I argued with him that uh, sending the cultures to a uh, central lab would be not as good as our local lab. And so we did the study. And in fact, the Fresenius lab was as good, if not better, than the local lab. And let me tell you why. It's because when we sent them to the central lab for Fresenius, we put them in blood culture media. But when we did to the local lab, the local lab got all bent out of shape about the uh, FDA's uh, statement that you can't use blood culture bottles for any fluid other than blood. And so they refused to do it correctly. Uh, and so lo and behold, the Fresenius ones were, were superior. So I just want to make a pitch for the culturing technique. The, uh, it may not be the absolute most superior, but it's certainly the most practical and cost-effective way. And that is putting uh, uh, what you presume is infected dialysate in blood culture bottles uh, in the right quantity uh, as if it were blood. So the same number of milliliters yeah. as if it were blood. So I'm uh, in favor of you sending it to your central DCI lab. Uh, well, and I think I think you just identified a whole other area of potential variability. And that is how the cultures were done, you know, within countries and in different countries. I mean, this could be a whole a whole area for for investigation i know that some years ago when we were talking about centrifuging dialysate uh i re reach which was recommended in some situations i reached a complete brick wall at our hospital well in in fact the uh ispd guidelines uh infection guidelines talked about centrifuging uh, washing and then uh, reinstilling it into blood culture bottles. We, uh, uh, Jay Bobby and I did a study, uh, which we did as a, a letter to the editor. So uh, uh, Pearl published it in PDI. You you ought not to uh, uh, do a pellet and resuspend a pellet into a blood culture bottle. You should take the app, the liquid, the apps, the effluent, presumed Effect, infected effluent, and that goes direct, inoculate that directly into the blood culture bottle. Thanks. I just wanted to comment about the use of APD. So when I was in Australia, we look at center related uh, factor for risk of peritonitis, and we look at use of IPD. APD, sorry. And what we've seen was that it was mostly, um, we divided in three categories. So here in this paper, it's by 10% increase. So they use a linear association. But what we did with, was that we divided in three categories. And 
the risk of peritonitis was much higher for centers that had a low use of APD, so the first uh, fertile, but there was no statistically significant difference for centers in the second and higher use of APD. So I think we need to be careful. It might not be that we need to increase use of APD from, I don't know, 80% to 95%. Maybe this is not where the risk is increased. It may be more in the very lower use uh, percentage. I'm not sure if that was clear. I like CAPD, so, <laughs> so it's, it's convenient for some of our patients. I think I think it's good to have a balance between both treatments. Anyway, that's my I, I, I think it would be wrong to use infection data to steer a patient towards APD or CAPD. I think that should be patient choice based on lifestyle. Well, but just but, agree. but Tom, Tom, just putting what she said together with what you said before, it may if if in fact there are people that we look at and we say, oh, we think you're at really high risk, then in in the lowest penetration places, those people might not be getting the benefit of APD, and maybe that's the difference. Now, in in rural Thailand, are you going to tell me how you're going to do that? I I wasn't thinking. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. I mean, that was no. I, I know you travel a lot, but I just wanted. I to I, I travel a lot to to Nashville. <laughs> yeah, that was one of the discussion points in the paper that the reason maybe the Thailand's uh, culture negative peritonitis rate is very high is because of uh, logistical issues about maybe they're getting antibiotic quickly from neighbor store versus sending the fluid all the way to their facility. And by the time the fluid gets there, the antibiotic has played some role. That was one hypothesis generated. And uh, because culture negative was so high, maybe some of that culture negative is actually gram positive, but not identified there for gram negative, even though gram negative is pretty high. That's why gram negative was higher than gram positive. So we're right up against the hour. So I want to respect everyone's schedules. Uh, you're welcome to stay on and chat, but I just want to say thank you to everyone for joining. Thank you for the rich discussion. And we will be back May 24th. I will send reminders, but we would love to have everyone uh, continue to join us. All right. Thank, thank you, you so much. That was great. Thank you very awesome much.